in the last few lectures, we had been looking at the classification rules and how discriminant analysis helps us into classifying individuals into two or more groups. We started by looking at the classification rules for two groups and then extended the results to several groups. We looked at primarily the expected cost of misclassification as defining the rules or sometimes at the total probability of misclassification. We also looked at how the different rules perform. Okay. And then what we looked at is some of the examples that we can have with the different types of distributions like the normal distributions. What we will be doing today is to look at the discriminant analysis from a completely different viewpoint. This is the viewpoint of Sir Ronald Fisher who actually was trying to separate groups of individuals into their respective groups. So, he had a large group of individual and he want to separate them out into distinct groups. So, it is something between clustering and discriminant analysis, but we know something about the population. So, it is more of a discriminant analysis problem and we will see that Fisher's methods actually lead to the linear discriminant functions or the quadratic discriminant functions that we had previously looked at. So, we are going to look at Fisher's way of looking at separation of variables. So, we begin by looking at the problem with two groups. So, we had m characteristics x is a vector of x 1, x 2, x m these are the characteristics of an individual and we have two groups g 1 and g 2. The sample sizes from each of these two groups are n 1 and n 2 respectively. The kth group g k is characterized by the probability function f k x. Fisher's primary concern was to separate the two populations G1 and G2 as far as possible on the basis of the two samples. So, what he wanted to do was to look at the two sets of observations from the two groups and then to identify the characteristics of these two groups, separate the individuals as far as possible on the basis of some rule. So, his idea was primarily to transform the multivariate x into a univariate observation z or y. So, he had a multivariate set of observations m and he wanted to make a linear combination of this into a single variable. As is obvious the simplest way to do is to take the linear combination of the elements of x. However, he assumed that x has the same dispersion matrix even they are if and if they are not normal they are having equal variances and uh, Fisher's method actually led to the linear discriminant function. Now, let us see how this works. So, let us look at how Fisher does this. He looks at a linear transform. So, suppose A is A 1, A 2, A m, a m dimensional vector and he takes a combination of this A's with the x's. So, y 1 i is defined as A prime x 1 i which really means that he is taking a combination like a 1 into x 1 1 plus a 2 into x 1 2 etcetera. And we can define this for all of the n 1 members from the first group. We will call this as y 1 i as opposed to the y 2 i's that we have for the members in the second group. Again this y 2 i's are the same combinations with a. a so, it is the same vector a, but now we have the x's from the second group and we have a, a prime x 2 i which defines this y 2 i for each of the members of the second group. So, we have two sets of this scalars y's. Now, suppose their means are y 1 bar and y 2 bar and we get the pooled variance which is s square which is the pooled variance for the two groups and then what we do is we take g equal to y 1 bar minus y 2 bar by s absolute value of this is defined as d 
and D gives the separation of the two groups G1 and G2. So Fisher decides that D can be a good marker for differentiating between the two groups. The goal is then to select an A which makes the separation maximum. So the point is we want to separate the two groups as far as possible. We make the difference between y1 bar and y2 bar large and to do that we want to select an A which would give us the linear combinations y1 bar y2 bar which will make this large. And the result that Fisher arrived at was that A prime came out to be x1 bar minus x2 bar prime S inverse. This is the combination A which maximizes despair. Remember S is the pooled dispersion matrix. So this is a sort of a normed difference between the two means, the mean of the first group of x and the second group of x. And the linear discriminant function y star came out to be a prime x. This is the choice of a that we have x1 bar minus x2 bar inverse s inverse multiplied by x gives us the corresponding linear discriminant function y star. And the maximum that this d achieves or the d square that we can get is x1 bar minus x2 bar prime s inverse x1 bar minus x2 bar. So what do we get from this result? Firstly that the discriminant function which optimizes d or maximizes d would be y star and the maximum value that d can actually achieve is the root of x1 bar minus x2 bar prime s inverse x1 bar minus x2 bar. This is referred to as Fisher's linear discriminant functions. But let us generalize this both to several population and let us have a very wider view of this. So if you look at several population, we have R group GK, K running from 1 to R and each of these groups are characterized by means mean K again k running from 1 to r, but they have the same dispersion matrix sigma. In this case, let mu be the combined mean, that is mu is the mean of the means mu case and b be mu k minus mu into mu k minus mu prime summed over k, which actually gives us the between group variable. So what is b? You look at in each individual term mu k minus mu gives us the distance of the kth group mean from the general mean and it is a sort of a square and product of this and when we sum this up this gives us the total between group variability for all the R groups and this is what we would try to maximize. So we try to select the groups such that there is maximum distance between the groups. The separation can now be looked upon this way. Consider the linear combination y is equal to a prime x as before. So again a is a m dimensional vector and its combination a prime x gives us a scalar y which actually is summation of say a i x i and therefore we have a linear combination of x leading to a single variable. For the g k -th group the expectation of y will turn out to be mu y k which is actually a prime mu k mu k is the mean of the axis for the kth group and pre multiplied by a prime this gives us the y for that group and hence the expected value would be a prime mu k. And for all the groups we have the variance of y equal to a prime sigma a. Again remember that all the groups have the same variance. So in this case sigma is not characterized by each of the groups separately and we have the variance to be common as a prime sigma a. The overall mean now is defined for y as mu y is 1 by r summation over k mu y k. It is again the means of the different groups, this means of the y's of the different groups and that gives you the overall mean of y. The separation now is given by d square which is mu y k minus mu y square summed over k divided by variance of y. Now why do we get this? What is this? First of all look at the numerator. The numerator is the sum of distances for each population mean to overall mean of y. 
So, mu y k is the mean of the kth group of y's and the separation of it from the grand mean mu y that is the difference that you get and we take the square of this and then sum it over all the groups that is what we get in the numerator and the total variability of y is what we get in the denominator. So, part of the variability of y would be between group variability and part of it would be within group variability. What we have in the numerator is the between group variability part of y. So, it is sort of between group variability divided by the total variability of y and it can be shown that this simplifies to a d square which is a prime d a by a prime sigma a. A prime sigma a is obvious because we have that as the variance of y and the numerator simplifies to a prime d a. So, the separation rule actually becomes a ratio of between and common within variability. So, the numerator is the between variability and this is the common within variability of x of y's. So, the idea now is to select a, a such that this square is maximized. So, the idea remains as before we are to select a, a which should be maximizing the d square value. What it does is it reduces the within group variability and increases the between group variability. It increasing the between group variability means there is greater separation, reducing the within group variability means making the groups more and more homogeneous. So, we have homogeneous groups which are separated as far as possible. What is Fisher's sample linear discriminant function? Usually this mu case would be unknown and so would be sigma. So, we have the unknown means and the unknown dispersion matrix. So, we need to estimate this. How? We have a training group which correctly classifies individuals which would allow us to estimate the parameter. So, we have n 1 and n 2 which we know to come from groups g 1 and g 2 respectively. So, these are well defined groups, the members are well defined within the respective groups. We will call it a training group and we will say that x k i is the ith observation from the k th group and we have n k observation from the k th group and there are r such groups. So, we define the sample mean and dispersion for the k th group as x k bar and x s k. So, these are sample versions of the mu k's and sigmas. Mind you, we are assuming sigma to be the same, but the sample variances would come out to be different for each of the different groups. Now, what we define is the overall average. The overall average is given by x bar, which is simply the combined mean coming from each of the r groups. The between group variability would now be given by b, which is x k bar minus x bar. So, x k bar is the kth group mean minus x bar which is the overall mean. So, take the difference, take the square and products. So, you get a matrix multiplied weighted by the corresponding sample size and then sum it over r. So, you get the between group variability and also we get the within group variability w which is in two parts. The, if you look at the inner sum of this i equal to 1 to n k, this gives you the variability within the particular group, the group say k equal to 1 or k equal to 2 etcetera. So, for the kth group we get this variability and then we sum this over all the groups to get w. Okay. So, we have each group within group variability and then we add up the within group variability for all the r groups to get w. Notice that w can be written as in terms of the dispersions of each of these groups or it can even be written in terms of the pooled variance s. So, you can write w in either of the three forms. Fisher's sample linear discriminant then says that if you have lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda q all greater than 0 as the non-zero eigenvalues of w inverse b, where q is smaller than both r minus 1 and m and h 1, h 2, h q the corresponding eigenvectors then what we do is we scale the h j's, we scale them such that h j's s h j is equal to 1. Having done that, we take a 1 equal to 
h 1 which maximizes d square. So, let us go back and see what we are doing here. We have the non zero eigenvalue lambda 1 is the largest of the non zero eigenvalues and h 1 is the eigenvector corresponding to the largest non zero eigenvalue lambda 1. Then h 1 as a 1 maximizes d square. So, how do you find the maximum? You just find the eigenvalues take the positive eigenvalues take the largest of the positive eigenvalues get the corresponding eigenvector and that eigenvector becomes your a and that is which maximizes d square. We call this the first discriminant. We can repeat this process choosing h 2 h 3 etcetera which are orthogonal to the first one and we get the jth discriminant as a j equal to h and a j prime x would give us the j th discriminant function. So, we can have all the q discriminant functions a 1, a 2, a q and multiplying by x we get the corresponding discriminant. The higher the order of the discriminant of course, the less variability of the data they account for. So, the first discriminant accounts for the maximum variability and inevitably this is the one which is almost always chosen and as we go along to a 2, a 3 etcetera, it accounts for less and less variability. So, what we do is it is usual that we consider the first two or three discriminants only because they account for most of the variability in the data. So, what does the Fisher discriminants do? They help us to discriminate and separate between the groups on the basis of fewer variables. Mind you originally you had m variables, now you have q variables where q is much large much smaller than m. In fact, you do not take all the q's, you take maybe the first two or three q's to look at the different discriminants. So, the first three discriminants would actually characterize the whole of the m variables that we had been looking at previously. Now, how does Fisher's discriminant functions helps us to classify the individuals? So, consider a classification based on the first s discriminants, s is anything less than q, usually again as I said it is 2 or 3. For any x let y j be equal to a j prime x. So, given a x we can always define y j which is the jth discriminant and we have s discriminants in this case we are considering s. So, we write the discriminants y 1, y 2, y s this is for a given x. Now, for the kth group the expected value of y would be mu y k because the kth group will have mean mu k for the x's and hence it will have mu y k as the mean of the y's for the kth group. And for any group the variance is going to be an identity matrix of order s. This is because mind you the ages are normed so the variances would be 1 and they are uncorrelated to each other orthogonal to each other therefore, the covariances would be 0 and therefore, the variance of y would come out to be i s and then we have a rule like this for any k the variability is accounted for by y minus mu y k sort of square. So, it is prime y minus mu y k. So, we were looking at the each of the j j discriminant the difference between y j and a j prime mu k its expectation and then square that up and then sum it over the s discriminant. The rule now is to allocate x to g k if y j minus a j prime mu k square is the smallest among all such variabilities. So, on the right hand side what you have is for all mu we get this and on the left hand side we have the value for k. So, k comes out variability for k comes out to be the smallest given the x and hence we allocate x to the kth group. So, what are the advantages of Fisher's rule? Number 1 it reduces the dimension of a large number of characteristics m to a suitably small number q which is very often either 2 or 3. It is convenient as a representative of the g k groups. It is easy to see that if you have m variables grouping would become much more difficult than if you have 2 or 3 groups 2 or 3 characteristics to group by. A plot of the first couple of discriminant functions helps to identify possible relationships and hence the nature of grouping. You see 
if you have m variables you can't do a plot but if you have just two variables to look at the first two discriminants then it's very easy to plot and probably from the plot itself you can get the idea of what the separation might be and finally a plot of the first two discriminant functions very often helps us to identify outliers what are the problems with outliers the problems with outliers is that they would form a group by themselves single member group or maybe a two member group a very small group but they would form a member by themselves and so we should be careful as to which one of these are outliers and whether we should be including them in the study or not today we saw how fisher actually classified individuals into several groups he used a separation method we had a separation function by which he can classify several individuals into different groups we saw that this method leads to the linear discriminant function or the quadratic discriminant function as the case may be when we have the underlying distribution as normal we also saw how individuals can be classified according to fisher's rule so fisher gives a completely different way of coming to the same discriminant functions and uh, this is therefore referred to as fisher's discriminant function 